Gross. I'm the curator of the fish and invertebrates here at Aquarium of the Pacific. Uh, before we get started, I just want to ask everybody to, to silence your cell phones and to refrain from texting during the presentation. Uh, thanks for your cooperation there. Uh, first, I wanted to thank our lecture sponsors, including the Gazette Newspapers and Courtyard Marriott. But tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Gray Burrard, who will discuss conservation of nautiluses and deep sea of the deep sea and work his work with the Save the Nautilus team. Greg is a conservation biologist for Save the Nautilus and a marine biology instructor for Des Moines Public School Central Campus, which is a really fascinating place. I was able to visit there last year. It's amazing what, what they do with their high school program. Hopefully, Greg will be able to share a little bit more about that. He has participated in 12 field expeditions for Nautilus conservation and presented talks and public pa published papers in scientific journals and other outlets on the topic. Dr. Brard earned his bachelor's degree in marine biology from Texas A&M University and his master's and PhD in biology from City University of New York Graduate Center. Uh, his current research focus is in the biology, behavior, and conservation of the Nautilus and deep sea ecosystem. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gray Brard. So thank you all. Wow, it's bright up here. So um, thanks for that introduction. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to come here and talk to you all about this little weird animal, the Nautilus, um, which I didn't really know about until about 10 years ago. So the area that I work in is in the deep sea. There's not a whole lot of light. And until recently, that's kind of what we knew about the deep sea. Uh, you can use trawls. You can bring animals up. Uh, you can use different kind of sensors to kind of see what the temperature is and what other things are down there. But it's not until you start going down there with lights and start putting lights down there that you see this deep sea is not just a diverse place, it's a strange place. It's a weird place and it's a place we know little to nothing about. Um, if you compare it to something like the coral reefs, you know, we can see them, we can see corals that are healthy, we can see corals that aren't healthy. We can't really see what's going on in this deep sea ecosystem. But all this starts a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, most of us, I don't think any of us were here around then. Uh, many of the animals and the organisms were pretty boring. Um, just single cell bacteria, not a whole lot going on. And it was really the coral reefs and the oceans that spurred life on the planet as we know it. So over 500 million years ago, coral reefs started to form, and then everything else happened after that. We see the first cephalopods here. We see jawless fishes, trilobites. Almost 500 million years ago, Nautiluses show up in the fossil record and start their little scoot forward. So as we start to travel through time to present, you'll see some animals that you're probably familiar with, the first land plants, crabs, sharks. You'll also see some mass extinction events that wiped out many animals on the planet. But hopefully what you'll start to see is kind of one of these one constant things is this little Nautilus swimming deep in the ocean doing its own thing. So we have more mass extinctions, mammals finally pop up on the scene, bony fishes, insects, we have dinosaurs, and I bet you can guess what animal's coming in from the left here pretty soon. It's going to be that little nautilus just swimming around. And now we get to this, you know, the age of humans, really, if you want to call it that. So these homo sapiens are seeing animals, and they're liking them for food, they're liking them for shelter, they're liking them for clothes, and they're really disappearing as a result of our interaction with them. And that's kind of what we think is happening with Nautiluses. So just to give you an idea of, of the animals that we know are extinct because we've wiped them out, that's just some of them. Um, it's not all the ones that we haven't even discovered yet that are gone because of our interactions. Uh, the vaquita is not necessarily extinct yet, but it doesn't really look good. And I'll come back to this vaquita uh, towards the end. But the question here is, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, five years from now, if someone was doing a similar talk, would they add nautiluses to their list? So what is a nautilus? It is a cephalopod mollusk. So one of their relatives are snails. Um, the nautiluses here are comprised of two genera. And it's just two different types. This is the fuzzy nautilus up here. So basically a nautilus with a fur coat. Uh, they're only found in Papua New Guinea, one place in the world. 
The other Nautiluses that folks are more familiar with are these guys. They have that striped external shell, no fur coat, so it's really cold for them in the deep sea. And the most close relatives are cephalopods. So um, the coleoid cephalopods, the octopus, which many folks are familiar with, the cuttlefish, the squid, the big difference is that shell. Nautiluses have kept this external shell, which its ancestors had, where all of their cephalopods have either reduced it or lost it completely. If you look at some other differences, the giant Pacific octopus here has eight arms. You compare that to how many tentacles nautiluses have. Nautiluses have up to 90 tentacles. And if you compare the appendages of the tentacles to cuttlefish and squid, cuttlefish and squid also have eight arms, but they have two tentacles which are able to capture prey with. So really, really different with the shell, really, really different anatomy. And if we look more closely at this nautilus, you can see the dozens of tentacles here. The tentacles can be protracted and retracted out of these buccal sheaths, so kind of like a sword that you're taking in and out. And they're going to protract themselves, move out if they smell something they like, whether it's a food, a mate, something. They have this really thick leathery hood here that they use for protection. So if something were to bite the nautilus, it closes up in that hood. And whatever that animal is, is probably not going to be able to get through that. Another big difference with nautiluses and other cephalopods is the eye. So if you think of your own eye, and you think of a squid eye, it's really a great example of convergent evolution. We have these really different animals converging on this one trait, this one characteristic of a complex eye that's pretty similar. Nautiluses do not have a lens, so we don't think they have the best vision. But if you're living in the deep sea, you probably don't need good vision. But it's another big difference that sets them apart from other cephalopods. Now internally, we can see what makes the nautilus so unique and why is it able to live so deep. So it's made up of all of these shells, or all of these chambers, and throughout these chambers there's a, a, a siphuncal, which is a fleshy tube that regulates a nautilus's buoyancy. So nautilus buoyancy is not similar to a submarine, it's not like a fish. Nautilus are actually very similar to scuba divers. So when you're diving in the water, you want to maintain neutral buoyancy in the water and move up and down. Nautiluses are able to maintain a buoyancy or an atmospheric pressure in there of one atmosphere about. So they can move from 100 meters to about 500 meters with no real problem. They can also, you can kind of make out here, they have a beak similar to all other cephalopods. They use that beak to tear off prey items from different things. And if we look just now at nautiluses, so we're breaking them up even further, we have our fuzzy nautilus here. We have all these nautiluses here that until very recently we thought were all the same species. So I'm sure you can see the differences. And just because they have color differences or stripe differences doesn't mean they are a real species. So the more we're looking into their genetics and the more we're actually looking into these differences in the stripes, it's turning out that they are all different species, which is a whole other thing to deal with when you're trying to save an animal. This is the area they live in. So they're found throughout the Indo-Pacific, as far north as Palau, uh, as far east as Fiji and American Samoa, Thailand, and then down into the Great Barrier Reef. And now within those ecosystems, they're found on these islands. So if you think this is, your, this is your island, this is your nautilus habitat, they have some constraints. So warm water will kill them, so you're not going to find these guys in the shallows. Too deep water, their shells will implode, so below 800 meters, you're not going to find them. Most likely, we think if they're living here, they're going to be eaten by big pelagic predators. So really, they live on the bottoms of these islands, and they're called nectobenthic. They aren't really moving within a meter or two of this, and they're not hopping to island to island. And if they're not hopping from island to island, if you look at three populations that we think would be relatively close, and we think about how they have um, fisheries in some of these areas, there is not gene flow. So there's not nautilus going from here to here. So if you have a fishery, if you have any take of these organisms, as they decline, they're gone. So these nautiluses here are going to be gone forever. They're probably different genetic stock than these. These are never going to repopulate here. And then if you're the fisherman, you're moving from island to island to island to island. And that's what we're seeing happening. Now within these islands, they also do these migrations, which is very, very different from other cephalopods. And this really just tells us what we don't know about nautiluses. So up until recently, we thought that at nighttime, nautiluses came shallow to feed. And then in the day, they went really, really deep to evade predators. But the more research we are doing, we're finding out that, again, we don't really know 
a whole lot about how nautiluses behave. Um, there's populations in Australia and the Philippines that don't behave anything like populations elsewhere. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that maybe their habitat plays a role in their behavior. There's different predators there. They're just not all the same. And answering these questions helps us put together that whole picture of what the deep sea ecosystem looks like and also what the entire ocean ecosystem looks like. We think this is how nautiluses find food. So most of these are going to be at about 300 meters, uh, the videos. This is in Australia. You can see the nautilus here. It's got its tentacles outstretched. And it's searching for this wonderful raw chicken neck bait that we use. They seem to really, really prefer chicken as a bait source. Um, it's what the fishermen use. But as it goes through the sand, it's digging through the sand. It's searching for something. And if you're in the deep sea, if you find a scent and you're close enough and you have these 90 tentacles that you can extend out, the likelihood of you finding something is going to be greater. So if that's how they find food, this is probably how they become food in some instances. This is, again, from Australia at about 300 meters. There's a very large grouper here. It's about four feet. It's not all on camera. But then it seems to team up with this other grouper. And obviously not a successful predatory attempt. We're biasing this because we're drawing in all these animals. So do groupers really eat nautiluses in the wild? We don't know. But you can see that really quick defense behavior of the nautilus. But the groupers are definitely trying to eat nautilus at these bait sources. Um, this might also be a predator of nautiluses. We have some here in our trap, chowing down on that chicken neck. And along comes a shark, which nobody can identify. And I don't know a whole lot about sharks. So I guess I thought if you saw the dorsal fin, if you saw the fins, you could identify it. Um, but we haven't been able to identify that shark. So if someone here knows or has an interest in sharks, let me know. But we do know that sharks have been caught throughout the Pacific with nautilus beaks in their stomach. Uh, they have the teeth that could potentially break those shells. So obviously, this shark was a little off in where it was going and banged into um, our camera down there. But again, another potential predator. And we can also see signs of predation in the shell. So there's so much that we can learn from this animal. If we look here, this is a live nautilus that we caught in Australia. This is a huge shell break. So some fish, some organism down there took this big V-shaped bite out of this nautilus. And what you're seeing here is the healing process. So think about cutting yourself. You have that scab over. That's what that, all that black color is going to be. And given enough time, if we were to catch this nautilus again, we have no, we have no idea how long it takes them to heal. But maybe in five years, after it heals, all you'd be left with is this V-shaped scar. So really unique healing capabilities. And if we look even closer into these shells, we see these little tiny holes. And what these holes are turning out to be are octopus drill holes. So octopus seem to be a very, very high predator um, of nautiluses. These were all live animals. So this wasn't successful predation. But is it the octopus learning how to prey on nautilus? Um, what's going on there? Again, we don't really have any sense of what's happening down there. So when a nautilus finds food, they usually find a mate. And this is how they mate. They're male here. We believe this is the male. This is the female. Tentacles all up into each other. And the male has a specialized tentacle called a spadix, which it uses to pass the spermatophore to the female. Now, they don't become sexually mature until 12 to 15 years of age which is very different than every other cephalopod. It's very different than most other invertebrates. And when they do finally become mature, when they do finally find that mate in the deep sea, they lay eggs. These eggs were taken from up in Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have some nautilus eggs there. The eggs are about an inch or so in diameter. The eggs take a year to hatch in aquariums. So putting all this together, this is a really slow growing animal. When we're thinking about nautiluses, we really need to be thinking about elephants about large mammals, about how they reproduce, because they just don't reproduce quickly. But this is why kind of we're here. This is why we started this work in 2010. Right around that time, an article came out in the New York Times just kind of saying, you know, we're loving the chamber nautilus to death. And we are, because, you know, the chamber nautilus is pretty. The shell you can do so many different things with. Um, but as we were doing so many different things, these fisheries and trades, nobody was regulating them. Nobody was even keeping track of what was going on. So the first really attempt at understanding just what's the scope of this? Is it 10 nautilus shells a year, or is it 10 million, um, was done several years ago. And these are the two countries that export the most nautilus pieces. And over a six-year period, almost 800,000 pieces of nautiluses 
were exported into the United States. So this doesn't take into account Europe, this doesn't take into account Asia. We don't know if it's a whole shell or lots of tiny earrings, it's just the best data that we have. But we know this tells us this is an important resource, something that we need to be looking into. So if we go beyond that and you conduct market surveys in the Philippines, areas where they've been fished for 40 years, if you look at when they started these fisheries to within 20 years, the fisheries have collapsed in all of these areas. And it's just straight across the board. You can just see it. Within, some within just two to three years, the fisheries are gone. And the really sad thing here is that the fisherman isn't picking up his whole life and family and moving to a new island. The trader moves, hires new fishermen, and then goes on and on. So nobody's really winning here. And recent data from these three on the right um, is only two years of data from this study, and there was no change. But going back now, you know, we'd expect to see a big drop here because the fisheries are still going on. And I think one of the biggest realizations was this isn't a fleet of fishermen. You know, I used to work in Alaska on fisheries boats, and you know, there's hundreds of people on a boat, sometimes huge boats. This is four individuals in one area catching 16,000 nautiluses in a year. And that's a ton. They're so easy to catch because they're so good at finding food in the deep sea that a fisherman can exploit that so well. So um, our initial question was, you know, how many are left? So since 2011, we've been to the Philippines, Australia, Fiji, American Samoa, Samoa, Vanuatu, uh, Papua New Guinea, and uh, most recently, we're starting a new project in Fiji, um, which I'll uh, talk about here a little bit. But this is what research is. You know, research is fun and everything, but nobody talks about this, about going through airports with all of these bags of luggage, about sleeping at the airport where you have those little bugs that fly around, and I guess you don't have mosquitoes here too much, um, but like to transmit all those nasty viruses. So this is part of it, and this is also part of it, um, kind of mundane tasks that we would consider mundane, something as simple as just counting rope to make sure we have 400 meters. So if we set a trap to 350 meters, we have enough rope. As we were doing this, these kids started fighting over who could help carry these kind of 50 feet cords of rope. Uh, which was really cool because a part of our work is kind of engagement and education and really kind of making that connection with these communities. So it's not like we're coming in saying, hey, you need to stop this. We're coming in trying to say, hey, how can we help? How can we do something better? These are the traps we use primarily in the Philippines. And this is the, the traditional trap they use. It's a really great design. They're bamboo, really lightweight. The Nautilus comes in, it kind of pushes through these doors, and it's a trap door. Once it's in, it can't get out. But to give you an idea, that's a two-inch piece of chicken that they're using to bait Nautiluses. So we use about two kilograms of chicken to bait our traps. And they're using a really small amount, and the Nautiluses are still able to find that food. And if we look at catch rates, so catch rates, how many Nautiluses per trap, or in this case, how many traps does it take you to catch that one Nautilus? So in the 70s when these fisheries started, at least when they started um, big time, it was about one Nautilus per one trap. In some areas that we've been able to replicate this at um, where they don't have fisheries that we know of, it's pretty similar. So we're thinking, all right, well, if you don't fish Nautilus, they are what they used to be. Now in areas of the Philippines that have been fishing them for decades and decades and decades, it takes a lot more traps to catch that one Nautilus. And, and again, this is back to the fishermen. That this doesn't mean that the fishermen fix another fish. They're probably fishing for everything out there. It just means they're spending more time out on the water trying to catch that one Nautilus to feed their family. And it's a really important consideration to take into account because this is significant income for them. Um, something we also do with this work, which I just don't have time to talk about too much, is we attach these transmitters to their shells. Now, if you saw this transmitter on a sea turtle or a shark, you would barely notice it. But it's pretty much the same thing. On the Nautilus, it's pretty obvious, but what we use these for is to track their depths or track their movements through depth. So after we put these transmitters on, we track them in boats for about two weeks, and we monitor their movement. And every second, we get a reading of their depth and the temperature at depth, which is really interesting because temperature in the deep sea Nautilus zone is something that folks also we don't know a whole lot about. So this is telling us how Nautiluses behave, but it's also telling us about this deep sea ecosystem that we're just starting to investigate. 
So thinking about the traps, you know, we bring these nautiluses to the surface, we bring other animals to the surface, that's highly stressful. Uh, we do release the nautiluses, but we're trying to figure out a way what's less invasive. So a method was developed um, out of Australia called baited remote underwater video systems. They use it throughout their coral reefs there. Uh, they don't really use it in the deep sea. But how it works is you have this steel frame, you have an underwater housing here, underwater housing here with a light, and then an HD camera in there. The important part is the underwater housing because we do go as deep as 600, 700 meters in some cases. And what you don't see here is off the screen is a bait stick. So we're trying to record the number of nautiluses, but also other organisms attracted to this bait source over time. And if we kind of look at how it works putting it all together, um, again, it's, it's very simple. It's a camcorder that you could get in most places. Um, it's not a live feed, which is kind of scary because we press record on it, we shove it in this housing, click it all in, and we don't really know if it worked until we pick it up the next morning. So we try to deploy these right at about 6 p.m. every single day across the Pacific. The camera's gonna record for about 12 to 13 hours overnight, and then we pick them up the next morning about 7, 7 or 8 a.m. or so. Um, this was our very first camera that we set in the Philippines, so we're a little late. So you can see it's a little dark there. It's not very fun doing this in the dark. And we're also kind of nervous about tossing over this camera system. So we kind of take a little bit too long. Now it seems like we just get there, kick it over, and then we're good to go. Um, you can kind of see the bait stick here. Um, it's different markings depending on what we're kind of, what other scientific questions we're asking. But it finally goes into the water. And then um, at this point, I like to do exercises. So for, I need some audience participation for this next part, if that's all right. Um, so if you could help. And I can see you out there now, my eyes have adjusted. Because if you don't help, it's gonna take forever to get this trap up. So if you were to do this for maybe another 40, 45 minutes, you would have your Nautilus camera up or your Nautilus trap up. And funnily, this has been the easiest method. We have had times where just in Fiji a couple weeks ago, um, we just pulled it up straight up. And it is heavy, it's about 100, 150 pounds. Um, but that seems to be the best method. And this is a really old picture, but I like to put it in there because this is the very first Nautilus, this trap I ever pulled up. And I remember it vividly thinking about, wow, this is, this is always what I wanted to do. You know, I'm in the Philippines, I'm in the ocean. So as we're going out to find the buoy, our fisherman who's helping us is already pulling up the trap. I think, no, I need to be there. I, I need to be the one helping. So I jump out of the boat, swim over to his boat, and I'm helping, I'm helping. And this is before I knew it was gonna take about an hour. So this is after about 30 minutes of what did I get myself into because it's me and our fishermen and no, no substitute. So we're just going and going and going. But you finally get it up. And the first thing you do is uh, make sure that no water is in the housings. And you might notice that duct tape. We do have hose clamps and things attaching these cameras um, to the steel frame, but we also wrap it in duct tape, I think, just so we could sleep at night. Um, just a peace of mind. But once we realize that there's no water in here, no water in here, then we look at the footage. And it's really interesting. Um, it's not just Nautilus. I think I was so focused on, well, where are the Nautiluses, where are the Nautiluses, that at first I missed all these things. You can start to see that our landings aren't always good. Um, you know, we don't really know what the ocean floor looks like. We know the depth. We don't know if our trap's gonna get spun over and kind of drug out to sea. Um, little bobtail squid there. And this is also a good um, shot of persistence and what kind of science really is because that bobtail squid was at the last 30 seconds of a 13 hour video clip with nothing in it. So there's not a whole lot going down there um, or it's a lot of the same thing. But if we move to some different areas, every one of these areas throughout the Indo-Pacific is different. So this is an American Samoa. Um, sometimes our lights do go out, but we pick up salps and really cool invertebrates and tinafores down there. We see nautiluses, we see little eels, and then we think our light goes out again, but we see something more interesting. So those three nautiluses there, two of them are mating, one of them is trying to mate with one of them. But then there's this big cloud of ink that goes through. We know nautiluses have really big um, olfactory organs, really big noses, but that didn't even seem to phase them. 
They finally let go of our trap. The current takes them away. This is the one trying to mate. These are the two mating. And then they go off. And that's what we see kind of. They have that meal. They mate because they probably don't see too many mates in the deep sea. So if we look at the Philippines next, um, there's not many nautiluses down there. But more interestingly, the animals down there are entirely different. Kind of some strange invertebrate jellyfish looking things. The fish kind of look like they belong in the deep sea. Most of the fish are dark colored. They have really big eyes, really big whiskers. We don't see a lot of shallow water organisms that we'd expect in the Philippines. And then we finally do what you have to do in science and write stuff up. And of course, what we expected is that wherever you fish Nautilus, those populations would be smaller. So throughout all that video, we were able to calculate population abundance in different sites. And we're able to show through statistics that in the Philippines, those populations are significantly smaller than other populations. Great. We kind of already knew that. But the big thing was that all these populations were a lot smaller than we thought. Uh, we didn't think that they were going to be this small, even without fisheries. So one question we get at this point is, well, let's breed them. That seems to be the answer to everything. If an animal's disappearing, how can we breed it? So it, it, would, be, it would be really cool if we can breed them, but can we? So let's consider their just reproductive history. So if you start this Nautilus breeding thing now, it's going to take you a long time to gain a profit. Let's also consider that the Nautiluses that have hatched in captivity, none have lived past a year. When they do hatch in captivity, they're not market size. So again, if you're thinking of this as, all right, let's kind of breed them for this market thing, these are things you have to consider. So you hatch out an inch, it's going to take you 10 to 12 years to get to market size. You know, how long can your investors wait uh, to really get their return? And growth in captivity is different. It's not necessarily bad for the animal, as far as we can tell, um, but it's certainly different. And again, if you're bringing this shell up to market versus this shell, there's going to be a price difference. So it's not really a viable option just to breed them. So we've kind of put all this together, and we look at the life history traits. We look at the unregulated fisheries. We look at the unregulated trading. And then again, we're answering a question that we already kind of knew what the answer was, is that we do see decline, and that we have seen local extinction in some areas. So it's not that just nautiluses are declining. There's areas where nautiluses are just not found anymore. So how do you protect them? You know, you do all this research. You talk to all these folks. One method is the Endangered Species Act. So that's strictly for the United States. And the Nautilus pompilia species, just one species, which is the most widely distributed species, was proposed to be on the Endangered Species Act. And this is a lot of words about just basically it's going through this process saying that, OK, well, we think Nautiluses may become endangered. Maybe we need to look further into this. And this has been about a three-year process to this point. So you do a review. You do more and more work to really make sure the science is what it is. Because if we don't really question the science of animals disappearing, we lose that kind of scientific appreciation of what all this work means. And the most recent finding is that, yes, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service believes that if we don't do anything, nautiluses will disappear throughout their range. And so we need to do something. One other method is a little more um, able to kind of help out for our purposes. So this is CITES. And so this is the organization that deals with regulating things like ivory and rhinoceros horn. It doesn't necessarily try and stop the regulation. It's trying to figure out a better way to do it. Um, so again, you write a proposal in 2016. This proposal was uh, co-sponsored by several countries and submitted to the CITES organization. Before this, you go through all of these meetings. And it seems really, really tedious, but I think these meetings are really, really important because I'm so invested in Nautilus, our team is so invested in Nautilus, that if we aren't questioned highly on our methods and on our results, then we might be going through this wormhole and really think there is a problem when there isn't. So um, before a CITES conference, all of these species that are aquatic species go to this meeting in Rome, and you have these non-biased scientists question you. It's the hardest test I've ever been in, because they're really questioning your life's work. Um, but they questioned it. They wrote a really favorable report, uh, which sounds weird to say favorable, that they do agree Nautiluses are disappearing. 
Um, but they distribute this report to different delegates and CITES, and then you go to CITES, well, what is CITES? It's this huge mess of jargon. 183 parties, but if you start to break it down, you know, there's some good stuff in this mission statement because trying to look at sustainability, it's trying to look at people, the environment, the trade, and this legal aspect of it, which is so important. So if you look at all that, CITES is a good option. It's a very good option. Now within CITES, animals are listed in different ways. So Appendix 1, you basically can't trade them at all. Um, obviously there's a black market for many different things. An example is sawfish for saltwater species. Uh, Appendix 2 is kind of you can trade, um, but we need to track it. So you need a permit to trade that. Some examples are seahorses and then many shark species now. Um, this level of protection um, is a level of protection where the United States, any country, could just say, hey, we're going to protect this animal. These first two up here, the majority of the 183 countries have to agree to it. So our goal was to get Nautiluses listed in under Appendix 2 because we thought it would help us kind of collect more information on the trade and on the problem. So you go to this meeting, and the last one was held in South Africa in 2016, and you vote, or the delegates from different countries vote, and you see it all up on the screen. You can see the yeses, you can see the noes, you can see the abstains, and you have to reach a 70 to 75% threshold. And fortunately for our purposes, we did. Um, so the countries voted to include Nautiluses on this new CITES list, uh, which was really great. You know, people were clapping. I mean, this was eight years of our lives kind of summed up into this one thing. And uh, so now you need a permit for export, which is going to be really, really, really good. It's going to be so happy. We're going to be able to check all these boxes. But is it? And then right away, what I thought was going to be the most kind of exhilarating part of my career, I was really depressed. Um, because what is CITES? What is it really doing? Um, is it going to be successful? Because we're all clapping on adding these animals to this list. And we're all just clapping the decline of all these animals that we haven't found a solution to stop. And CITES has been around for quite a while. And I'm going to bring back that case in the beginning. Uh, but there's another fish, the Totoaba, uh, which has been on CITES Appendix 1 since basically CITES inception. So that means that since 1977, this Totoaba fish could not be legally traded anywhere in the world. But it has been for its swim bladder which can sell for up to $10,000 a kilogram in Asia, and China specifically. Now, as you're fishing for this fish, there's bycatch. And the bycatch has been this vaquita. And it's been on this list since 1979. And I, I, I hope there's some out there. I know there was a big push. They, I think, caught two recently, so there's still some out there. But CITES isn't the only thing. So I think a lot of times, you know, we can get stuck in these, oh, great, we did this CITES, but now what do we do? Because it's very important to answer that. The Nautilus is living a big range. So some of the pushback is that there's no way you can fish out all these Nautilus populations, which probably you can't, at least in the next few years. Over the next century, sure. I mean, sure you could. Laws change all the time. So we have data from really good places, but we also have holes in our gap where we don't have a good understanding of what Nautilus populations look like. We even have holes in those holes because within areas there's smaller populations. So there's still a lot more work to be done, and how do we do that work? Well, very close to being after CITES, we went to a new place, Papua New Guinea. Uh, Papua New Guinea is just north of Australia, and it's the one place in the world that has the fuzzy Nautilus and the regular Nautilus living side by side. It's also one of the few places in the world where deep sea mining is starting pretty soon. Um, but this animal, we thought, or everybody basically thought it was extinct um, until we recorded it. So the last time folks had seen it alive or seen shells washed up was in the 80s. And at least we were able to go back and find that it's still there. But you know, first of all, why does it have that fur? I mean, why does it have that thick external, sh or external covering on its shell when other nautiluses don't? Um, last year we went to Palau, and Palau is a unique case because there's no fishery there. There are nautiluses there. There's also these other big things there, um, big six-gill sharks and small two sand tiger sharks. And I put that specifically in because these were taken from the same video, and 10 minutes apart those sharks collided, or they collided at some point. Um, so again, we're searching for nautiluses down here, but we're learning so much about these other things down there that um, is really helping us kind of paint the whole picture. 
And looking more closely in Palau, it's almost annoying because there's so many nautiluses. How do you count how many nautiluses are on this bait stick? So fortunately, their shell is their fingerprint. So every one of their shells is identical to that individual nautilus. So if we have a nice little picture here, we can take a snapshot, compare it to any other nautilus shell we see and know that's gonna be the guy. Uh, but here in Palau, the most we saw on one bait source was up to nine total nautiluses trying to eat that chicken. And we also saw some different behaviors. So up until this point, we thought nautiluses were scavengers. They would only eat decaying material or dead things on the floor. But on two occasions in Palau, this nautilus here, we believe is trying to eat this crab. And maybe just take off a piece of its shell, maybe take off a parasite on the shell, we don't know. But whatever it's doing to this crab, the crab finally doesn't like it anymore. So it pinches that nautilus. And then you'll see that nautilus and that defensive mechanism kind of tucked up into it. And you can see how big that crab is. So, um, you know, is the nautilus trying to eat the crab? It's hard to really say. All we saw was this behavior over multiple nights. I mean, it may be enough just to get a little bit of shell. We know nautilus eat molts in the wild. We know in captivity they'll eat lobster shells, they'll eat lobster molts. Um, but what's going on there? Even weirder, every nautilus curled its tentacles up on the back of the shell of other nautiluses. Now they're not sexually dimorphic. We can't really tell if this is a male or this is a female. We can kind of tell by how they interact and how they, or how they start to mate. But just looking here, we don't know. But after looking at hours and hours of this, we believe this is a male that's curling its tentacles on different nautilus shells. We don't know why, but is it a courtship behavior? Is it telling that nautilus something or is the nautilus telling it something from doing that? Um, all we know is that we don't see this behavior anywhere else throughout the entire Indo-Pacific. So we're kind of working from a different hypothesis now. So if we take Palau, again, this is what we think maybe is a normal population, and we take fisheries into it. So if you have fisheries and you don't have fisheries, so we know that the populations are different um, with fisheries. We also know that the shells are different, and also the size of the animals are different. And this really isn't... Um, just for nautiluses, in many fisheries, you know, the more you fish, fish them, the smaller the fish get. Um, so we know there's some differences there, but are there also differences being forced upon the nautiluses by these fisheries that are changing their own behaviors? So are they becoming scavengers only as they're being fished out? Because in many of these areas, it's not just the nautiluses fished out, it's all other animals. And is it changing their courtship behavior? And it, again, this is all just looking at this and kind of thinking of what could be going on. But if you're living in Palau, you can smell nautiluses all around you. Are you going to be more apt to have courtship behaviors where you can pick that animal that you, know, you really want to mate with because you know there's another one over there? Versus if you're in an area where you don't smell other nautiluses and you finally bump into one and find one, you better mate with that one so you can pass on your genes. So you know, it's really interesting what's happening in Palau. And Taking all that um, and adding more to it, you know, what is going on down here? Sedimentation is happening in all these areas, many of these coastal areas, so you're bringing all of these nutrients and other things to this area where nautiluses are searching for food, and nautiluses are also very sensitive to basically anything in the environment. They don't have a protective epidermis like many fish do, like we do, so any toxins or nutrients are really being absorbed by every quarter inch of the skin. You add deep sea mining into it, and I'm not necessarily saying deep sea mining is a bad thing. All I know is that where it's starting, it just doesn't seem like we have enough baseline data to understand what normal looked like before deep sea mining um, started. And this is already happening in Fiji and Papua New Guinea. The deep sea mining company doing it is Nautilus Minerals, which is kind of interesting. Um, but there's so many other things. You know, we talk about climate change on land, climate change in the coral reefs. What about the deep sea? Um, the habitat, but what else is going on? And we can't address any of this until we address the fishery, because again, that's the most sort of pressing thing, destroying Nautilus populations. So putting all this together, you know, we're trying to develop a new way. What are we gonna do in the future? Because we can't just do CITES. So we're developing this program that hopefully will kind of combine uh, not just resources, but thought, and maybe have somebody look at videos in a different way, but really look at lab research and field research so that it's really informing one another. 
you know, because you can say in C2, XC2 research and all this stuff, but it's really hard to connect the two to really help each other out. And so we just started this uh, first year in Fiji. This is gonna be a five-year project uh, where we're, we have really high goals. Uh, everything we do in Fiji, we wanna model for the entire Indo-Pacific of not just how to protect Nautiluses and manage Nautiluses, but how to manage your whole deep sea ecosystem around you. And so for more information, so we just got back from Fiji 10 days. Um, you can check out our, uh, our blog here through Nat Geo. But uh, recently in Fiji, we worked with the Ministry of Fisheries to see how many Nautiluses were there in different areas. One of our goals is not just to go there and the research stop. One of our goals is to go there and train fishery officers, train students, and really increase that capacity building in these areas. So this is one of our traps here um, in Fiji. And we're kind of getting ready to start fishing for Nautiluses there. It's going into the water. We have grubs there too. So everything we're doing is kind of similar throughout every place, but it's also very, very different because the resources in these different islands and countries are so different. You kind of have to figure out how can you make it work at every different place. Sometimes we have big boats, sometimes we have small boats, sometimes we have a boat like this that breaks every 20 minutes, but it gets the job done, and uh, you know, it's important. Um, this is one of the bruvs we're putting in, lots of work, and uh, this was a nautilus we caught in Fiji, and the Fiji nautilus appeared to be the smallest nautilus left out there. Really, really different. But these are all fishery officers. They hadn't seen this animal before, um, so they're really excited to see it, and I don't think they remember that I'm in the water right now releasing a, a nautilus that we had caught. And as I'm releasing it, I'm seeing all these skipjack tuna around. And we're in 300 meter water, a couple kilometers off the barrier reef. And I'm thinking, oh, this is cool, it's tuna. And then something pops in, like, well, there's tuna, what eats tuna? And it's also around sunset. And you can imagine what's coming up now. Now these you know, six foot sharks are starting to show up and they're taking pictures up there. And I'm like right over there. <laughs> It was a really interesting feeling because we release these nautiluses, we have to release them in a proper way that we burp the air out of them because when they get into air, they could get air trapped up in their shell. And if they do that, they're just gonna float on the surface and eventually die because of the warm water. Um, so we have to free dive them down or scuba dive them down a bit. And, uh, but the excitement of just seeing this animal they had only seen the shell of you know, was really evident. And it's a really easy way to get folks to buy into that. So these are some of the videos from Fiji. Um, this was an area in Fiji that nobody had seen Nautiluses from, so we wanted to see if Nautiluses were there. This was in Savu Savu. This was the first Nautilus ever recorded there. Different little setup, but same chicken. You know, same idea. We're trying to attract these Nautiluses to our bait. And that same behavior, that outstretched tentacles. You know, searching for that bait, it finally finds it, tries to take it away, but realizes it can't, so it just settles down and uh, eats for a couple hours. Oh, stupid. But what comes in are these bobtail squid, which are really, really cool, but they're also shrimp. And the kind of side note to these bobtail squid, in 2013 we were in Fiji, we recorded one. In 2018 here in Fiji, we recorded at least three every single night, like every hour. So again, this might be information for bobtail squid people about you know, what's going on with their populations there. Is there a boom or something? Um, but really cool stuff down there. And we see some shrimp, we see our chicken, and again, in the back of our mind, you know, what's an animal that could be causing these shell breaks on Nautiluses? And you kind of start to see it back here. Uh, we have caught these eels called conger eels before, but their mouth is really blunt. It's not really a mouth that could kind of crack a shell, get into a shell. We have never seen these eels anywhere throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think it's called a pike conger eel, so it's similar, but the mouth is like an alligator. The mouth opens huge, so right away, you know, of course right away we want to say this is the number one nautilus predator out there. It's about six to seven feet. It's a huge, huge animal. It's interested in the chicken. You can kind of see its mouth opening up, but it seems like that animal that could kind of break that shell. And again, why we're interested in this, if nautiluses disappear, other animals are gonna be affected too that may use them as a prey source. So you, you affect this whole balance in the ecosystem and uh, it never gets to our chicken, it kind of leaves off. But you know, you can see it has some force, it has some power. And again, we've seen this 
every single time, every night in Fiji this past year that we did not see five years ago. Huge, huge mass. Um, this is a very strange behavior that we did not see anywhere else. Uh, symbiosis, that's all you would say. I don't know. So this is a Nautilus coming up to our bait. This is a fish, no idea what kind of fish. And at least it looks like the fish is using it as some type of protective cover. Um, don't know for how long. It doesn't really leave the shell to go eat. Um, no idea what's happening with this behavior. After an hour, the fish just kind of scoots away and it's gone. But you know, what is happening there? So are all these other animals also dependent on these nautiluses that again, if nautiluses disappear, what do these other animals do? And uh, this was our last night in Fiji. Our, tra our trap, had, our cameras had just landed. So no attraction or anything, and that hammerhead was just swimming by. So big hammerhead, looks like about six to seven feet, and it just happened to be down there. So again, we're starting to add to this big picture of this deep sea ecosystem. And uh, the Fiji Nautilus, we believe, is so different, and also its genetics are so different, uh, that we're publishing uh, a paper, submitting a paper on it being a new species. So Nautilus Fijiensis or Nautilus Vitiensis as it's pronounced there. They're very, very different. We give them very good names, 18-4. Um, but really, really good way to engage the community. And so it started with a new Nautilus species, but now they're also starting to highlight the fact that we're there doing outreach programs, that we're there helping the community, we're doing things in schools. We want to be there for a while. We don't want to be here just for this. So this was really, really exciting. And uh, kind of related to that, this is going like, to be a big spin, um, our students. So the other part of my job, which starts next week, is teaching high school students in a marine biology class in Des Moines, Iowa, not just about the Nautilus, although they're probably the smartest students in the world about Nautiluses, but about the marine ecosystem, about conservation, about how to care for the place that you call home. Um, so this is our facility in Des Moines. We have over 100 tanks, about 15,000 gallons of salt water. This is our largest tank, it's about 2,000 gallons. Uh, we have things from cuttlefish, octopus, corals, we grow, uh, we rear jellyfish, culture jellies, so many different things that these high school students are doing that I think this is a really important thing. And I, I was asked a question today if I, if I have hope for the future. And I, I really want to say no, because I have a hope for 30 years from the future. I think if you can engage students at that age, then, and you realize that you may not see change for 20 to 30 years, that's when you might see it. Um, we do have novelists in the lab, and we brought them in. Just the total excitement of just this weird animal was so evident. Now, as a scientist, I want to say, well, how can I prove that this kid, who is actually in Australia in grad school now, um, studying sea urchins, but how is he going to change the world? I mean, it's hard to do. This is really qualitative. All these students aren't going to be marine biologists. But hopefully all these students see this cool animal that's important to care about, and they apply that you know, to the whole ocean and hopefully to the whole planet. And it's kind of spread throughout our school. So yes, in marine biology, I have to say Nautilus 100 times a day in class just to say it. But there's also art programs and other departments that are starting to do things related to Nautiluses. And when we have tours and when the, you know, we have schools visit from kindergarten up to sixth grade, you know, they send notes thanking you. And of course, I mean, they're kind of weird Nautilus drawings, but you can see that. I mean, you can see you're making an impact. Um, the Save the Nautilus organization, uh, which, scratch that, I'll come back to that. That's a surprise. Um, but this was a cool thing that uh, last year we take our students on a field studies course every year somewhere throughout the country to really learn about marine biology and conservation. And they wanted to do something nice and so they pulled together their uh, funding and they surprised me at the end with you know, a little donation to our Save the Nautilus organization, which doesn't seem like much, but again, you're getting that engagement, you're getting that buy-in, you're getting these folks to really care about what you care about. Um, one of our former students who is now a graduate of college, um, she excelled so much that she was on our Palau trip last year. Um, so it's also you know, a way to get involved in research and to really see what research really looks like. 
And again, it's not just Nautilus. You have students now asking questions about, well, how can we do better with our corals that we have um, in our aquariums? What's the best way to light them? Uh, we have an Oceans Day, which is now an Oceans Week in Des Moines, where students do different projects to highlight things throughout the ocean. It might be something as simple as what is an octopus to you know, how do you solve the world's plastic problem. But you're getting students excited in this. You're getting students excited in science because they realize that they can do science, that they can understand it, and that they can inform other people. You know, they can make an impact. It's not just adults, it's not just scientists. Um, and we've started an adopt a stream program because I was pretty far away from the ocean. I'm already not looking forward to driving back. But uh, again, what can you do in your local community to make it just look better? So we have a Raccoon River, which is near our um, program, where several times a year we go there and you know, we just pick up trash. You know, many people do it, but you know, how do you get folks to really start to care? And uh, this upcoming fall, um, we're gonna do a no straw thing and the students collected straws to kind of see just how many straws they use in a month first. Because if you don't really see the problem of how many straws your class uses in a month, it's hard to really make that change. Um, they turned it into these different art pieces that this sea turtle will get ahead eventually. Um, but we're gonna take these to different businesses and organizations and hopefully we'll get a no straw week in Des Moines that you know, might go bigger. So all these things that these students are doing and it really all started with these two kids here, Josiah and Ridgely, that started the Save the Nautilus program because Josiah's mom sent him that New York Times article in 2010. And he read it and he just thought as an 11 year old kid then, you know, this is silly. Why are we killing this animal? It's been around this planet for so long. So they started this organization that since has raised 30 to 40,000 for our research. Um, he's 17 years old now, about to go to college. She's about 17 now too. But again, they started something because they wanted to help. And um, the website is pretty good. Um, there's cool stuff on there. You can help, but I think the big thing is it's not just monetary support. I think the biggest thing is just telling other folks and realize that you, know, you can be that impact to somebody who you might not even know. You might just meet in a uh, supermarket or something or meet at a lecture or something. So, so many things that you know, we're learning from these students, which is very, very cool. And related to all of our work, when we do field stuff, we do outreach everywhere, from Fiji to American Samoa. Some places you have nice facilities, some places you, know, you don't have any electricity. So you're trying to show these Fijian students what's in the deep sea right kind of outside their window and what is really down there. Um, we have a Nautilus puppet that has traveled the world um, just talking and talking and talking because that's what you want to get. This is actually at a Sunday school in Fiji. And the interesting thing about here was listening to, you know, we have this planet, we've been handed this planet to whomever you may think, and it's our, it's our chance to kind of take care of it. We have to maintain it. So, you know, what does it mean that this little girl's looking at this Nautilus sticker? Who knows? All I know is there's an impact there that is going to help. And there's a Nautilus girl who um, I talk about probably way too much, but she's in Halloween right here, um, not looking for treats. She's actually handing out little leaflets about the Nautiluses to people. I mean, she's doing so many cool things, and you know, you try and support. What can you do? You send shirts, you send books. Um, she's actually, I don't I think I can say it, but she's actually working on a, a stop motion film for Nautiluses that uh, hopefully we'll get out soon, but She's nine now, and she's doing this. And this is at an aquarium in Dallas. This is just a guess, and I think she just started talking to them about Nautilus. And again, the cool thing is that, yes, she puts some of her you know, savings to Nautilus, but also she does to other animals, to the local zoo, to the local conservation thing. So you find that one animal to get folks to buy into the bigger picture. And so you know, if Nautilus has continued to disappear, the fisherman loses the environment loses, because whenever you lose a species, you lose the, the uh, ability of that ecosystem to adapt to change. You lose a potentially you know, complex animal. We like to call octopus smart because they can do all these different things. Well, nautiluses are also able to learn and remember things. You just have to ask them different questions. And we maybe lose an indicator species. Again, if we're tracking nautiluses through the deep sea, we might be able to see temperature changes through there that we don't know. Maybe we can track climate change better in the deep sea than we can in the coral reefs. 
And um, really, you take away an animal from evolution. So when you're taking away an animal, you're not just taking away what it was, you're taking away you know, what that population could be. And we don't even know what we're doing now. How will it affect things a thousand years from now? We have no idea. So remember this. This is kind of depressing. Um, but you know, think about how can you make that impact with somebody with whatever age. And you know, it's something so small as them seeing an animal for the first time, them getting a sticker. Um, and they speak English fairly well. But I imagine that you know, I wasn't understanding them too well. They probably weren't understanding me too well. But we connected on that. Um, so obviously, this is a huge team throughout all of these years, a uh, huge team of funders throughout all of these years. You know, thank you so much to the Aquarium of the Pacific for you know, inviting me out here. And uh, I want to leave you with one, one last clip of lovely Nautiluses there just minding their own business. You know, they're chowing down on the Nautilus. This one's trying to figure out this one's a female or something. And then um, we have this fish come in. So this is a mola mola or a sunfish. And uh, this is at 300 meters, which seems fairly deep for them. And that stupid fish knocks off the Nautilus. But the weird thing is that it goes back and forth. Like the sunfish is just swimming in the back for hours and hours and hours. So again, what does that even mean? Um, so I'll end there, but we have lots of other videos you know, that you can see of, of not just sunfish, but Nautilus and cool things. And then if I have time for questions, I'd be happy to take them, but thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Greg? I was wondering when you put the trackers on the Nautiluses, how you actually can track them, because I don't know how you can track them underwater when they don't come to the surface. Yes, so how, how we track them is we're in a boat with a hydrophone, basically, and a surface receiver. And just like a sonar signal, we're looking for louder beeps that are more closely together. So if it's right underneath us, we're there sitting. And then we start to see that we're moving this way. So we move in the boat and go over here to track it here. And then maybe it sits here. And then we move. So we're constantly moving with it. So we do this for up to two weeks. And we're in shifts of my, my shift always seems to be 16 to 18 hours. And my colleagues is like six to eight. But that, that, that's, that's the best way we can do it, is just going through it. And the batteries last about two weeks. So after that, it's not really worth tracking. Anybody else have any questions for Greg? Okay. Were the camera traps always on the bottom, or did you ever suspend them at a depth? Uh, we never suspended them at depth, because based on what we know, we think Nautiluses are only going to be on the bottom. But we tried different depths on the bottom. So we'll do 300 meters, but also 200 meters in some places, 100 meters. So we do that, but our consistent mark is 300 meters throughout the Pacific, so we can compare that. be like what my first day of class is next week. There's no <laughs> question. Um, I was wondering, you're talking about predators of Nautiluses, but m generally speaking, most juveniles are preyed upon in adult, of species in general. Is that a factor that you take in on? Like, just like trying to figure out who the predators are? Do you know if their juveniles are being preyed on um, who they are? So I guess we don't know. We've never seen it. We assume that there is definitely some predation of a, a small animal like this could get swallowed up whole pretty easily. Um, we use the shell to kind of see where these shell breaks were. Did it happen earlier in life? Did it happen later in life? But we haven't really went into the details of are, are they being preyed upon more as juveniles or adults. We're just under the assumption that they are. Once they get that big shell, we think that they're probably not preyed upon too much because it is so big. Um, but 
getting to that big shell is the hard part. Does that answer that enough? I want to I thank you for your lecture. Um, I had no background on this subject. I was wondering, um, you mentioned there was some type of um, a fish where they want the stomach. Yes. Yes, and I want to ask about that. And on the Nautilus, during reproduction, has there ever been where it's had twins or triplets or it's always just single type of births? Yeah, so the, the totoaba is the fish. And I don't know too much about it other than that it's, it's fished by using gill nets. So these gill nets catch the fish, the fish get stuck with their gills, and the fishermen just pull them up. And it's fished for its swim bladder, which is dried out and used for various things in, in China. Um, with the twins or triplets, I don't think we, there could be. I, I don't know of any reports of that happening. Um, it's so rare just to get nautiluses breeding or mating in captivity to get them to lay eggs and then to get those eggs to develop uh, that right now I just don't think there's enough people doing it to answer those questions. I imagine it's possible. And then you were showing the area where they're becoming distinct because they just stay in one area. Has there been any thought about trying to physically move them over? to another area so that that's not so problematic? Yes, there has been thought. Um, but before we do that, we really need to know their genetics better to know that, you know, are we putting these animals in an area where they can breed with these other animals? Uh, we also need to understand, you know, what species are there. Are we moving these nautiluses here that, you know, maybe they'll outcompete something else and they'll be the invasive species? Um, so I know that's something that, you know, we're tossed around because you have to consider that kind of thing. And we just don't know enough yet to even be able to, to think about it. You're welcome. I just want to add one thing about the little transmitter thing. Because one question we usually get is, doesn't that affect their behavior? And I would think, yeah, if I'm wearing a huge thing, that it would affect my behavior. Because how do we know that we're not just tracking a big shark that just ate the Nautilus and we're following this shark around? So it's a huge bias. And we had some things happen in the last few years that tell us that we think we are tracking the Nautilus. So um, in the Philippines, two fishermen caught two of our Nautiluses with transmitters six and nine months later, and they were alive. They were in the same area. So they had survived all of that capture. They had survived putting this weird thing on their shell, and they exhibited the normal behaviors enough to be caught by a fisherman. So that was really good. And in Vanuatu, we recorded a Nautilus with one of these transmitters on our underwater cameras feeding off the chicken. So exhibiting those same behaviors and everything. So there's still always a chance that you know, something's going wrong, but those two things tell us that you know, we are tracking the Nautilus, the, the methods work, they're surviving. Um, so it's really, really good for, for our, the science part of it. So. How about another round of applause for Greg? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for making the uh, long drive from Des Moines. <laughs> Um, if you can, uh, please join us on th this Thursday night. We have another exciting lecture by Dr. Drew Loher. He, he will be here to discuss his 2017 Science Under the Ice Expedition in Antarctica and how climate change may be affecting marine biodiversity in that area. If you can't join in person, please join us on the website, aquariumofpacific.org. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice night. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Really Thank you. That you're doing your Volvo Pipe Fish series. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank I you.